to start us off, we're going to hear from Dr. Katja Schmalenberger from Germany. Katja serves on our clinical advisory board and has collaborated closely with Dr. Tori on various projects, including improving the reliability and validity of the DSM-5 diagnosis for PMDD, and on investigating the prevalence underlying mechanisms and consequences of cyclical changes in cognitive functioning. Their work together has led to several high impact publications. Most recently, Katja served as a reviewer on a very timely paper on trends in PMS and PMDD research. We asked her to share with us the top line findings of this publication. Please join me in welcoming Katja. Thank you so much, Sandy, for the nice introduction and, of course, to the whole wonderful planning committee for this exciting roundtable. I am so happy to be part of this and to talk to you today about trends in PMS and PMDD research. More specifically, my talk is based on a recently published paper that you can see on this slide. In April of this year, a group of six researchers based in China around first author Mingzu Gao published this article with the title Trends in Research Related to PMS and PMDD from 1945 to 2018, a bibliometric analysis. The paper was published in the journal Frontiers in Public Health, and I was very lucky to have been picked by the editor of this journal to do a so-called peer review. That means before the article was published, the authors and I went through several feedback loops where I could tell them, do this, add that, discuss this, and they had to do it so it would get published. So that was fun for me, and uh, now I'm quite familiar with the paper and happy to present its main results to you today. But before we dive into that, I just want to briefly introduce the concept of a bibliometric analysis. A bibliometric analysis is a statistical evaluation of scientific articles. In our case, its aim is to provide an overview of former, current, and emerging trends and critical turns in global PMS and PMDD research. And given that the authors looked at articles published between 1945 and 2018, we will be looking at the last 73 years of research. It is really great that these bibliometric analyses exist because they help us to get a good overview. So let's take a look at how the authors searched for published PMS and PMDD research articles. So next slide, please. Thanks. <laughs> okay. The authors focused on one database for scientific articles. Oh, unfortunately, it's not. Um, it was just the logo. It's called Web of Science. So you're not missing anything with the um, exclamation mark. And they searched um, this database in September 2018, which explains why more recent articles from the last two and a half years are not included. In a perfect world, they would be, but it takes some time to do the analyses, write the paper and publish it, especially if you have a very strict reviewer. So it's actually very typical that literature reviews don't include the most recent work. When searching the database, the authors included the list of search search terms you can see in the middle of the slide. It was premenstrual syndrome, premenstrual tension, premenstrual dysphoric disorder, premenstrual dysphoric and premenstrual dysphoric syndrome. However, what we know as PMDD today was first included into the DSM-3 TR under the label late luteal phase dysphoric disorder. Only in the DSM-4 TR, the label was changed to PMDD, which was in 2000. So there might be publications not included here that tackle PMDD, but called it differently. But nonetheless, they still found 2,833 articles that they included into their analysis, which is an impressive number. As you can see in the exclusion criteria box, all of these articles were in English. They had to exclude um, articles from other with other languages. So the first thing the authors did was look at when these almost 3,000 scientific articles on PMS and PMDD were published. And we can see the graph on the next slide. Thank you. Um, as you can see, there were relatively few publications until around 1980, which makes sense because like I just said, PMDD was called differently back then, and probably there was just not that much research on the subject. But then starting from 1980, we observe an upward trend in annual publication outputs with the maximum of 124 annual publications in 2008. 
Ever since then, the number of annual publications has somewhat plateaued and is fluctuating around approximately 100 publications a year. We can interpret this as a stable interest in PMDD and PMS in the last decade. But as a PMDD researcher myself, in my opinion, there is uh, still room to grow and it should always be more. So after investigating when these almost 3000 articles were published, the authors looked at where they were published, in which um, journals. Next slide, please. Here you can see um, a list of the 14 journals which published the most PMDD and PMS papers. However, it's important to keep in mind that the journal with the most published papers, Psychoneuroendocrinology, only published um, a little less than 3% of the total of almost 3,000 articles, as is indicated with my upper circle. So our PMDD and PMS research is widely dis distributed across all sorts of journals. On the one hand, this might be good since PMS and PMDD then reach a bigger audience because the readerships of all these journals is getting aware of the disorder. On the other hand, our information about the disorder might be um, a little scattered and since it is not centered just around a handful of journals. Regarding the focus of the journals, PMDD and PMS research can be mostly found in gynecological, psychological, psychiatric, and psychosomatic journals, which feels very natural since all these disciplines are involved in our scientific efforts to understand the disorder. The, the right column of the graph that is marked with IF 2017 lists the impact factor or short IF of each journal in the year 2017 which um, can be seen as an index for the quality of the journal. Four or five is actually very good in psychological research, and there are some of those journals in the list here. And even one journal, Biological Psychiatry, has a double-digit impact factor and 31 publications on PMS and PMDD, which is also very good. Okay. Okay, so now that we know when and where our almost 3000 PMS and PMDD articles were published, let's take a look at which countries contributed the most research. Next slide, please. So let's first take a look at this very interesting bubble-based graph the authors present. The larger bubbles represent the more influential countries in the field. It's the US, Australia, and the European countries, England, Sweden, Italy, and Germany. What is also very nicely visualized here is how extensive the collaboration between countries is, indicated by the lines between the countries. The list on the right quantifies the country's contributions and shows the 10 countries with the most publications in the field. The first one is um, USA, as you can also, is also indicated in the, in the bubble-based graph. Two Asian countries made it on the, on the list um, of top 10 countries contributing, and it's Japan and China. China is the sole country from the developing world to be in the top 10, showing its vast progress in life science over the past decade. So given that some of these countries are very big, the authors also zoomed in and took a closer look at the exact research institutions that contributed research in the field. And we can see the results on the next slide. With a very impressive graph, um, but uh, maybe let's take a look here at the table. Um, eight out of the 10 institutions with the most publications in the field are US based. Out of these eight institutions, seven are universities. And then, of course, we have the National Institute of Mental Health. The only two top 10 institutions that are non-US based are Umeå University in Sweden and McMaster University in Canada. So the US has a very active PMDD research community, which is wonderful. The only thing we have to keep in mind here is that only English speaking publications were included into this analysis. And of course, the US is a big country with many whole universities compared to, for example, the smaller European countries, where interest in PMDD is definitely big as well. Okay, so now that we know in which year, in which journal, by which countries, and by which institutions our almost 3,000 PMDD articles were published, let's zoom in even more to the person level and, and um, let's take a closer look at who published the most PMDD research. Next slide, please. <laughs> In order to get a face to the name, you can see pictures. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tjobo and Buxtom is, is, is not able. You cannot see him, but 
at least the other pictures are fine. So sorry. So in order to get a face to the name, um, you can see pictures of the uh, four authors with the most PMDD publications. It's Job on Backstrom, David Rubino, Alan Freeman, and Peter Schmidt. Dr. Backstrom is based in Sweden at Umeå University, which is in line with the fact that this university made it in the top 10 list of contributing institutions. Dr. Rubino is based at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, um, Dr. Freeman at the University of Pennsylvania, and Dr. Schmidt is at the NIMH. A big thanks goes to all of these researchers, given that they really advanced PMDD research and contributed so much in, to the field. The only thing we have to keep in mind when looking at this list is that it shows the absolute number of publications. So younger scientists who do not yet look back on decades of research are less likely to make it on the list. But there are brilliant young scientists in the field who contribute highly impressive work and from whom we will definitely hear a whole lot in the next decade for sure. Next decades. <laughs> okay. So I think we have a very Good overview, uh, thank you. A very good overview now as to, uh, as to when, where, and by whom PMDD research was published. In the last part of my talk, I want to take a closer look with you at the content of this research. Because up to this point, the only thing we know about these almost 3,000 publications is that they contain the keyword PMS or PMDD, because they needed this, these um, keywords or one of these keywords to be included in the analysis. But we don't know anything more about them up to this point. Um, and so now let's take a closer look at what exactly are these um, articles looking at. So next slide, please. <laughs> On this slide, you can see two tables. The left one shows us the frequency of keywords in publications, and the right one shows the centrality. Well, let's start with the left one, the frequency. The most commonly used keywords in this list were PMS, menstrual cycle, and PMDD, which is not surprising since the search term was PMS or PMDD. So they had to have one of those two words in there. Interestingly, the keyword luteal phase was about two and a half times more frequently used than the keyword follicular phase, and progesterone was about two times more used than estrogen, which is in line with our understanding of the more symptomatic phase of the cycle and the underlying mechanisms of the disorder. Also, the term or oral contraceptives made it on the list of the 20 most frequently used keywords, but not the term SSRI, which is interesting given the latter's central role in the treatment of PMDD. Similarly, regarding sy symptom content, depression made it on the list, but not, for example, irritability, which is often considered a cardinal symptom in PMDD. So uh, we have some hints on, um, on, on the content of these, uh, these papers now based on the frequency of the keywords. Okay, so let's move over to the right uh, table that depicts the centrality of keywords. And in order to understand what is meant here, let's visualize each keyword as a node or a bubble in a room, and then the centrality of a keyword is calculated by the number of neighbors this node has. When we go to the next slide, it becomes a little bit um, more clear. Um, the most central keywords, that is the keywords with the most neighbors are indicated by big crosses. Those are again, PMS, PMDD, menstrual cycle, and uh, women. And again, keywords like luteal phase in the upper left corner, progesterone in the middle left, and major depression in the middle right are central. Interestingly, we have serotonin as part of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or short SSRIs, and fluoxetine, a type of antidepressant, in our graph of central keywords now, next to oral contraceptives, which might reflect research on the treatment of PMDD. We also see allopregnanolone on the lower left side, which might reflect research on the underlying mechanisms. And we have the keyword prevalence on the upper left side, which might hint at our many efforts to investigate how many cycling individuals are affected. So now that we know which keywords were frequently used and which ones were central, the authors also talk about so-called burst keywords. Next slide, please. Up 
I hope you can see it a little bit clearer than than I can see it on my screen. But I'm 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 saying the most central things, so um, yeah, you you won't miss anything if you can't read it. So so-called burst words represent words that are cited frequently over a period of time and thus can indicate trends in research. The time interval from 1950 to 2018 is always plotted on the green lines, while the periods of burst keywords are marked in red, indicating the beginning and the ending of each burst. For example, the first line shows us the burst of the keyword premenstrual tension from 1950 to 1993. We could probably talk about this graph, which stretches across the next three slides in great depth and for a long time, but maybe we follow the lead of the authors in their publication and focus more closely at the last decade of research from 2008 to 2018. Next slide, please. Here we can see that prevalence, the word prevalence and the keyword systematic review are the only two keywords with citation bursts around 2008 that are going on until 2018. You can see both these words when you look for the red lines that reach the right end of the graph, which stands for the year 2018. So let's start with thinking about why the keyword prevalence might be a long and ongoing research trend. Why, why are we looking at the prevalence of PMDD for such a long time now? This could go back to PMDD being a complex, multifaceted diagnosis that requires prospective daily symptom ratings. Unfortunately, which of course you all know, unfortunately, however, there are a lot of retrospective questionnaires out there on which a lot of published articles are based on. And this has resulted in high highly varying prevalence rates for a long time. So of course it was necessary to keep investigating it for a long time. And luckily by now we have some high quality longitudinal data from population-based samples on prevalence rates that paint a clearer picture. But it was really necessary to look at it for a long time. And when we think about why systematic review might be a keyword with a long and ongoing citation burst, it is important to keep in mind that systematic reviews of randomized control trials are fundamental to the practice of evidence-based medicine and to evaluate the effect effectiveness of drugs and methods for the treatment of a disorder. So in our case, it is really great that systematic reviews of, on PMDD treatment keep on being published, given that we want to provide the best care for everyone affected by the disorder. So next slide, please. So this is the last part of this um, um, graph on the burst words. And um, so we focus now on the time from 2010 and 2000, until 2018. And here we have long and ongoing research trends revolving around the keywords impact, menstrual cycle phase, risk factor, anxiety, depressive symptom, and quality of life. The authors conclude that key directions of research in the last decade were understanding who is affected by PMDD and how they are affected. And given that anxiety and depression are two, emotional, uh, are two core emotional symptoms of PMDD, it is not surprising that these keywords have citation bursts as well. However, interestingly, these are only two out of the four core emotional symptoms and mood swings and anger and irritability are not listed. It is not possible based on these analyses to conclude that mood swings and irritability were neglected in research, but I still thought it was interesting to note. Okay, next slide, please. This is um, the, the summary um, of, especially of the last graph, which is very um, impressive and a little overwhelming, but, um, to sum up this graph, we can see that in the last decade, from 2008 until 2018, key directions of PMS and PMDD research were to understand how many cycling individuals are affected by the disorder, what makes it more risky to be affected by the disorder, and what it means in terms of, in terms of symptoms to be affected. And as the author state, our findings indicated that PMS and PMDD research is currently an area of active investigation and numerous findings are constantly emerging. I think this is very nicely put and very much to the point. And as a PMDD researcher myself, I can only say that it is an incredibly interesting field of research with so much uh, still to explore. And I cannot wait to see what the next decades of research from all these brilliant scientists will reveal. Mm -hmm.